So thank you very much, Gareth, uh, for a great talk. Actually, I'll show some data from Brazil that are interesting in comparison to the data from the UK. So now I ask you to shift gears out of Europe and all the way down south, uh, Brazil. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about uh, the story uh, of uh, Lifromeni syndrome and Lifromeni-like syndrome in Brazil. So what I wish to do in this 20 minutes that I have is to give, give you a very brief overview uh, of the phenotype and especially of the founder mutation R337H that we identify in a large set of our families in southern and southeastern Brazil. It will be very brief because many colleagues, I believe, will touch again upon the subject in other lectures. And then I want to show you data from our research group, first um, exploring uh, the frequency and the effect of a variant in a, a outside the coding region of TP53 in the three prime untranslated region, uh, which we identified in a proportion of Brazilian families and which may account for cancer predisposition in these families. And also I want to bring some new data on the pathogenicity of this founder mutation, which is very common in Brazil, and I think several other colleagues will touch upon uh, this subject also in their lectures. Uh, for the families that are here, if you don't understand something, I apologize in advance for that, but you can uh, be okay because most of us also still don't understand many of the things that we see, so that's okay. So let me start by uh, mentioning this very, very important paper, which came out in 2007. Um, it was led by Maria Isabella Schatz, who will also be speaking here. And this is really a very important paper because it was the first to uh, systematically test uh, the entire coding region of TP53 in a group of patients who had the phenotype of LFS or LFL, any like and Marie Isabel recruited 45 families from her area and also from other areas in Brazil who had the phenotype, and she identified uh, germline mutations in the coding region of TP53 in 13 patients, about 30% of the families, and about half of the patients who had mutations had the same mutation, R337H. This mutation had been described before in Brazil, uh, it was described in a cohort of patients with adrenocortical carcinoma, and it had been previously suggested by Dr. Raul Ribeiro from St. Jude's that it could be an uh, adrenocortical-specific mutation, a, a tissue-specific uh, mutation. And so the important, uh, one of the important aspects of the study of Maria Isabel back in 2007 is that she clearly showed that the families that carry R337H and apologize, this is a little small, perhaps you won't be able to see, but I tell you that many of the families had adrenocortical carcinoma, as expected. Not all of them had this type of tumor, and most of them had other tumors of the Lifromeni and Lifromeni-like spectrum, such as breast cancer and soft tissue sarcomas. And interestingly, she also identified in these families tumors that were different from the classical tumors usually described in Lifromeni, such as gastric, thyroid, and renal tumors in the high frequency in these families. After that, many uh, researchers in Brazil started to look at the prevalence of R337H in pediatric cancers and in breast cancer. So first, in pediatric cancers, what is very clear to us now is that really the majority of patients that are diagnosed with adrenocortical carcinoma have R337H. And the figures go from 80 to over 90% of the children and adults with adrenocortical carcinoma having been carriers of R337H. So it's very strongly linked to adrenocortical carcinoma. Another tumor that is much uh, less frequent also in Brazil but is strongly associated with R337H is choroid plexus carcinoma. And there was a surprising article that came out from a group in, in the state of Sao Paulo who also showed that 7% of osteosarcoma patients had R337H mutations. These are consecutive series of patients not selected for family history. So this is a prevalence in individuals diagnosed with these tumors. 
The data on osteosarcoma was not replicated, and we haven't seen it in other studies so far. In breast cancer, there are several studies also. Uh, this is just one of the studies that came out from our group. We studied uh, over 800 patients and selected for family history who had different uh, uh, breast cancer at different ages. And uh, in summary, what we see is in Brazil so far from the data we have is that 5% of patients with breast cancer that fulfill criteria for the hereditary breast and ovarian cancer syndrome are carriers of R337A. About 10% of women diagnosed with breast cancer under the age of 45, regardless of family history, are carriers of the mutation also. So it's very important in women with premenopausal breast cancer. And 20% of women diagnosed with breast cancer at or under the age of 30 years, regardless of family history, carry the mutation. I have to say that the, the series of cases that we've studied so far is rather small. So we just looked at 65 patients with breast cancer under the age of 30. This is a much smaller cohort than the one that Dr. Evans just reported. But still, the numbers are quite impressive. And what we have to do now is look at other regions of Brazil, not only southern and southeastern Brazil, uh, to see if these numbers hold or if it's just something regional from this area of the country. And finally, we've also identified the mutation in women with malignant and benign phyllodous tumors of the breast. So nowadays, and this is, has been published very recently by Marisa Bell with the court uh, from, from her institution. In Brazil, we recommend that every woman with breast cancer under the age of 45, and especially every woman with breast cancer under the age of 30, regardless of family history, be tested for R337H. And there is an ongoing discussion if patients with um, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer criteria should also be tested, but this has not been um, decided yet. And finally, the last uh, paper I wanted to show you in this overview of R337H is this very important paper that was published in 2013 in JCO, uh, which uh, uh, describes the results of the first years of a program of newborn screening for R337H uh, which is done in just one state in Brazil, in the southern region of Brazil, which is the state of Paraná. And in, in this study, where they report the results from the first 171,000 newborns tested, they identified 461 carriers, which comes to a population prevalence in that region to about one in 300. So one in every 300 newborns in the state of Paraná is born with R337H. And again, the most frequent tumor that they identified was adrenocortical carcinoma, but they also identified in the first years of follow-up of these newborns and, and children, other tumors, some of them classically associated with the lifromany uh, and lifromany-like syndrome. And what I want to stress about this study, which is so important because I think it's the largest study done so far looking at a specific uh, TP53 mutation, uh, is the, the question of the phenotype. So here we have a very large series of families or probands with the very same mutation. And what they've seen is that 30% uh, uh, had absolutely no family history of cancer. Uh, this is very important, and this is really what is the argument uh, that the group uses to continue doing uh, newborn screening, because you won't be able to identify all carriers just by looking at a phenotype if 30% of the individuals don't have a phenotype. And what I think is the important lesson for us is that even a family, even families, a group of families that has the very same mutation will have something else modifying the phenotype. So we'll see individuals with a mutation with absolutely no family history and other individuals with a mutation where you see the entire phenotype. And it's really a challenge to know when you identify a patient which one is the case there. Is it a family that will be less penetrant and you won't have the full-blown phenotype or, um, or not? 
and what is it that is causing this difference. And, and finally, a, a major question that I think is a universal question and not different in Brazil is that for the majority of families where we see a family history, where we have criteria for LFS or LFL and we indicate testing, there's just as much that we identify in terms of mutations. So uh, in the classic paper from Chompre, they identified a, a germline TP53 mutation in about 30% of the families uh, with the Chompre criteria. These are the criteria that in Brazil we use preferentially to uh, test patients. And both in the paper of Maria Isabel in, in a recent cohort in our group, the numbers are pretty similar to the original Champre uh, mutation prevalence data. So 70% of the families that have testing criteria, that have a family history, I'm not even talking about those that have no family history, but in those that have a family history, we uh, do full, full um, coding region sequencing of TP53 and mutation uh, and rearrangement analysis, and we cannot identify um, disease-causing mutations. So this is a, a significant problem, and uh, I, I know there's, there are several groups, and I think many people here also will discuss uh, what else can we do to really uh, identify the molecular reason uh, behind that uh, phenotype. So this is one of the families from our clinic where we see, where we have the situation. So the proband is a, a woman that unfortunately is already deceased. She had breast cancer uh, very early in, in, at the age of 20. Her father had been diagnosed with a sarcoma at the age of 62. And both of them came to our clinic and both of them were tested uh, for P53 mutations, and we were not able to identify anything. And we have several of these families, as most of the clinicians in this room probably also have. So in 2011, a paper came out uh, by Stacy from a cohort in Iceland where they did uh, GWAS uh, testing, looking for variants that would account for an increased risk for several types of cancers. And they identified a polyadenylation sequence, uh, sequence uh, variant in TP53, which they related to predisposition, to susceptibility to uh, basal cell carcinoma, glioma, and prostate cancer, not breast cancer. Uh, so when we saw that paper, we thought, well, maybe there could be something related to that variant in our families without a known uh, mutation. Interesting, interestingly, Stacy and also other uh, authors later on, they uh, showed that this variant results in uh, impaired processing of mRNA and decreased expression of uh, TP53 in individuals who were carriers. Uh, so uh, Gabriel Macedo, who is a researcher in our group, um, started the study to look into this variant uh, in our patients. He recruited 512 women uh, from uh, our region, southern and southeastern Brazil. Uh, the study had collaboration from Isabel in Sao Paulo and also other colleagues uh, in other states of Brazil. And basically we looked at 213 breast cancer affected patients who had no criteria for TP53 testing. We looked at about 300 controls, which were breast cancer unaffected women from the general population and 259 uh, individuals with the LFS or LFL phenotype who were either mutation carriers or non-carriers. And I'm sorry I'll have to point to just one screen here, but you will see that uh, among breast cancer affected women, the variant was not identified. It's the C allele here. Uh, it was also not identified among uh, LFS or LFL patients who had a TP53 germline mutation in none of the 130 individuals with a mutation, but it was identified in families with the phenotype, but no coding region mutation in P53, and also in a smaller uh, frequency, at a smaller frequency in controls, and the difference be between these groups was uh, significant. Gabriel also did, again, uh, functional studies on TP53 expression and fibroblast of some of the patients carrying this variant, and again, he saw a decreased expression in P53. And here are some of the 
pedigrees, you'll see that there is a, a significant uh, number of these pedigrees, uh, these families that have uh, early onset breast cancer, also uh, different types of sarcomas. They're not classic LFS, but they do have a phenotype that resembles LFS. So uh, in conclusion for this part of the talk, uh, this allele, this, this variant, induces abnormal termination and polyadenylation of the TP53 transcript, resulting in reduced P53 expression. It occurs within a highly conserved region, so it's reasonable to think that it has an effect. Uh, it does not seem to co-segregate with other germline pathogenic mutations in P53, which is, again, another evidence to suggest that it's likely a disease, it could be a disease-causing mutation, and the tumors identified in the seven variant-positive families resemble, or some of them are characteristic of LFS, LFL tumors. Uh, this is something that I would like to propose to other colleagues in the room, whoever is interested. Uh, it would be very important to do additional studies in different courts, including segregation analysis to really further characterize this variant and confirm whether it is really a disease-causing uh, alteration or not. And for the last part of my talk, I would like to uh, discuss uh, very quickly some results, also very preliminary results, coming out from our lab, uh, looking into the pathogenicity of r 37 h Again, other colleagues will touch upon the subject, but uh, really, this is a question that for us is very important. It's such a common mutation in our population that we really should understand the mechanism of disease behind that. And it's not an easy uh, question to answer. So what we started to do a few years back uh, in patients and families with R337H is look at the metabolic aspect of these patients. And we were particularly interested uh, in the antioxidant function that has been described uh, for P53 and uh, how, it, how it works in these patients with r 37 h So again, Gabriel, uh, my colleague, uh, proposed a study uh, looking at oxidative damage uh, in carriers of the r 37 h mutation. This was a relatively small study. We recruited patients uh, with the mutation and uh, non-carriers as a control group matched for age and sex. And we looked at several different parameters of ROS-induced damage and oxidative damage in the blood of these patients, in, mostly in plasma. And interestingly, we showed, and this again was a small cohort, very preliminary results that indeed there was damage uh, to lipids and proteins in the samples obtained from plasma. And what was even more interesting is that among the carriers of R337H, we had both patients diagnosed uh, previously with cancer and patients without any previous diagnosis of cancer. And the, the evidence for damage to lipids and protein, ROS-induced damage to lipids and protein. The profile was almost exactly the same in these two groups of patients. So this was the first uh, evidence. Several other authors uh, looked at this and published about this, mainly in uh, patients with DNA binding domain mutations, not R337H. I think Dr. Huang will also show some results. He published a very interesting study but with uh, patients with DNA binding domain mutations with similar results. So uh, Gabriel then went on and decided to expand uh, this investigation, looking at uh, additional parameters in prim primary fibroblast cultures from uh, patients with the R337H mutation and other mutations. So, Again, these are very preliminary and also unpublished results so far. But uh, what, he, what he identified, uh, first he recruited uh, nine individuals with different TP53 genotypes and performed skin biopsies, establishing primary fibroblast cultures from all of these individuals. So he included uh, two uh, 
individuals with DNA binding domain mutations, G245S and R273H, two individuals with R337H, one, uh, um, actually three heterozygotes for the mutation, and one patient who is a homozygous mutant, and three controls who had been sequenced uh, for TP53 mutations and had uh, no abnormalities. And he first looked at several parameters in the baseline, in the primary fibroblast cultures in the baseline, and then uh, he uh, uh, developed a protocol to induce, at least try to induce DNA damage uh, using UVB and ionizing radiation, and he looked at uh, repair activity 24 hours after the damage. So uh, first looking at the baseline, uh, what he uh, identified was that in the patients, in the, in the cell line, sorry, that uh, has a DNA binding domain mutation, there is a significant increase in oxygen consumption in comparison to controls. Uh, in R337H heterozygotes and homozygotes, fibroblasts, the, this parameter seems to be exactly the same as in the controls. And also when he looked at the profile of uh, respiration uh, in these cells, the pattern observed in the DNA binding domain mutation fibroblasts were different than from the other cultures, suggesting or indicating an increased mitochondrial oxidative uh, activity. He also looked at ROS production uh, and on the expression of antioxidant proteins. And what is very interesting is that, sorry, what is very interesting is that uh, here is the control. Uh, this is uh, uh, R337H carrier. This is the homozygote, and this is the DNA binding domain uh, mutation carrier. For the heterozygotes, both R337H and DNA binding domain, there was an increase in ROS production. It was only significant in R337H, but it was mild. But in the homozygote, it was really significantly increased in comparison to the control. And he also observed increase in the expression of uh, GPX1 and SOD2 in the homozygote and in the heterozygote only uh, SOD2 seem to be increased, suggesting again an increased antioxidant uh, response in these uh, cell lines. He then looked at DNA damage response. This was a study, this was a part of the study that was done in collaboration with Dr. Sylvie Sovego in Grenoble. Uh, he used uh, two different assays developed in Sylvie's lab, which are multiplex enzymatic DNA repair assays looking at different uh, DNA, uh, uh, different types of DNA uh, damage and the repair activity towards those uh, insults. And I'm just going to show very briefly part of the result. So here you have a heat map. Repair activity is shown in a way that the shades in blue indicate less repair activity. Remember, this is 24 hours after ionizing radiation and shades in orange and red indicate very increased repair activity. So here, looking at the first assay, which includes both nucleotide excision repair and base excision repair damage, you see that the R337H homozygote remains with a very high repair activity even 24 hours after the insult. This is usually not expected. Uh, the DNA binding domain mutation has an intermediate repair phenotype, and R337H carriers are very similar to the controls. Uh, looking at the second assay, uh, both uh, looking at uh, repair after 24 hours after UVB and ionizing radiation exposure, there's also a, a, some results showing uh, impaired um, repair or sustained repair actually after 24 hours. I want to concentrate at this part of the chart, 24 hours after ionizing radiation, and here you see that the repair activity of certain lesions 
um, and especially uh, this type of lesion, THFA, which is uh, uh, AP sites, where, which are characteristically lesions induced by ROS, uh, repair is still uh, very high after 24 hours in the homozygotes, in the uh, DNA binding domain heterozygote, and also in the R337H um, heterozygote. So, um, and this, this is another, just another way to look at the data. Here you have the wild type fibroblasts, and here you have all of the uh, mutant fibroblasts combined, and you can clearly see that there is a significant, uh, significant difference here, uh, especially regarding uh, the type of lesion induced by ROS, which are the A-basic sites. So in conclusion, Fibroblasts from patients with germline TP53 mutations show an hyperoxic phenotype with increased ROS and mitochondrial respiration. This is very obvious for DNA binding mutation, has been shown by others before, uh, and is also in agreement with previous finding uh, of increased oxidative damage in R337H carriers um, in LFL patients' blood. This effect seems to be attenuated in R337H mutants by the remaining wild type allele. However, it is extreme in the homozygote. Thus, in R337H heterozygotes, and especially in the homozygote, there seems to be a loss or a decrease in the antioxidant function of P53. And finally, in mutant fibroblasts, there is persistent DNA repair at high level, even 24 hours after damage, suggesting that DNA repair is impaired in mutant cells. The persistence of high repair activity of AP sites may indicate that ROS damage is overwhelming in this scenario and overwhelming the DNA repair machinery. So with that, I conclude. I would like to thank all of the patients and families in Brazil who have uh, donated their time and samples for, to enable this research. And also, I would like to thank the many collaborators in Brazil and uh, in other countries. Thank you. Um, any questions? Good morning. Thank you for a really uh, a brilliant paper that was really elegant. My question is just to ask you to speculate how your findings that you just described contribute to the unique phenotype of this mutation. That's a good question. I don't know the answer. I mean. Uh, if we, I mean, there's several other questions that remain to be answered. Uh, originally, uh, there was a suggestion that R337H would be dependent on specific biochemical or pH um, scenarios within the tissue. Mm -hmm. For instance, in adrenocortical carcinoma, that uh, uh, a situation where you would have an increased uh, physical increased pH compared right. to physiologic would contribute to uh, a failure in correct oligomerization of the tetramer, and thus it would be functional. Uh, maybe there is a combination of effects here, a biochemical effect. Uh, maybe there is indeed increased ROS production, and this will also contribute to the effect. Um, perhaps in some families, the biochemical or the metabolic aspect is more striking. Mm -hmm. There are other factors that determine that in some families and not in others. But I think that uh, apart from the genotypic abnormality from the finding and sequencing, uh, the metabolic features that we start, are starting to see in the patients probably will have an important role in the determination of the phenotype. What a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Paul Wong at NIH. A very nice presentation. Just uh, struck by the, uh, the very dramatic increase in oxidative stress in the homozygous mutant HH state. Um, do you think, just I guess a couple quick questions. Do you think the ROS is coming from the mitochondria, or I, the, the assay, or can you localize it and have you done any studies with the mitochondria to see if there's any difference in the human, at least in the homozygous state, whether any changes in 
the, the uh, composition of the mitochondria? That's a very important question, an interesting question, uh, because if you look at uh, oxygen uh, consumption, which was the first chart I showed, it's not really increased in the R337H carriers and homozygotes, only in the DNA binding domain mutation. So we don't know the answer to that. And we certainly have to look further uh, into the mitochondrial uh, metabolic pathways to see if we can understand why this is going on. So what lessons do you think this has possibly for prevention, antioxidants, uh, maybe metformin, you know, we're going to hear about later, do you think there's any traction there from what you've done? Uh, well, the first question is whether these metabolic findings really have an effect on cancer predisposition. Yep. Yep. That's something that no one has answered yep. yet, it's just a finding. Yep. And if it has a clinical effect, it's still an open question. And then the second question is, if it does have a clinical effect, uh, can we control it? Can we change this effect by using some sort of medication? I think this is a great question, and I think soon there may be space for a larger trial, clinical trial, looking at the effect of antioxidant drugs, if this profile is really confirmed. As I said, these are very preliminary results. We unfortunately just have now we have three patients who are homozygous for R337H. This study was just done on one cell line from one patient. Yep. So I think we have to be very cautious yep. in interpreting these results. Yes. Hi, Trent Osler. Um, I had a specific question about your findings. Very interesting. Um, at, the, at the three, I was wondering if, if you had, if you know about any um, specific structural changes that has taken place on the 337th position I and mean, how, how P53 is changing based on that mutation? And so that's my specific question. More generally, um, do you know of research that is um, kind of categorizing different mutations and how that changes the structure of, of P53? There are some studies looking at the structure uh, and in different types of mutations, yes. Uh, in vitro studies, I think Dr. Zambetti will also discuss specifically on R337H, so I'll leave most of the answer to that question uh, to his talk. Um, perhaps one of the things that may be happening and may have an influence in R337H is that depending on a because most of the patients are heterozygotes, right? So you have normal and mutant allele. And the way they come together in the tetramer may be something that could influence the phenotype. So if you have different proportions of mutant and normal allele in the tetramer, that may uh, be part of the explanation on the different phenotype. But I personally would not know the entire answer to your question. Sorry. Thank you. No more takers? Okay. Thank you very Thank much, you. Patricia.